All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Doe. I'm with University of Maryland Extension and happy to be here for another Wednesday webinar with the Mid Atlantic Women in Agriculture program. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, talking about capturing the flavor of herbs and spices and happy to have Beverly Jackie with us today. We're going to let her introduce herself in a little bit before she gets started. Um, I would like to thank our sponsors of this program. We offer webinars. Uh, twice a month, you can see upcoming ones here in the blue link extension.umd.edu backslash women in ag. You can go to webinars and see what we've got planned all the way through December. We'd also like to thank all of the collaborators uh, that are part of the program. So with that, I'm going to have um, Beverly can bring up her presentation and we will get started for the day. Okay, so I want to make sure everybody can see that. Looks good. Okay. And you're going to want to start a presentation. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to that. And here we go. All right. So, um, again, welcome everyone to the capture the flavor urban spices workshop. My name is Beverly Jackie. I'm a family and consumer sciences educator at the University of Maryland Extension. I cover the upper shore counties. And for those of you who are familiar with Maryland, that's uh, Cecil Kent and Queen Anne's counties. So today we're going to just focus a little bit uh, talking about um, lots of different areas of herbs and spices in terms of cooking and storage and so forth. So um, as I was mentioning earlier, if you came on um, a little bit uh, later there, I will be providing the slides as well as there's like three or four great handouts that um, uh, give you examples on how to blend um, spices and, and what spices pair well with other foods. So you'll have a lot of those resources. Um, feel free to take notes, but you will, you will be getting them. Okay. Um, so this is me, um, as I mentioned, um, and I cover those counties. So what I'm going to do now, as I mentioned earlier, is I am going to shut off my video just so that we can save some bandwidth and we don't lose uh, internet connection. Okay. So the learning objectives we have for today is I'm hoping that you're going to find out some new ways of using herbs and spices from a cultural perspective, understand some best practices for storing herbs and spices, and then uh, also some of the practices that are used to process um, herbs and spices safely. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the health benefits. So you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Uh, I think what I'd like to do, unless there's a pressing question, is just address all the questions at the end. So I make sure we get through you know, all the information here. All right, so this is the agenda, how this presentation's laid out. We'll talk very briefly about the history of herbs and spices, spend some time about cooking uh, with them, how to store them, um, as I mentioned, the food safety tips, and then we'll wrap up with the health benefits. All right, so a little bit about the history of herbs and spices. So, um, spices today are plentiful and are used mostly as flavorings. However, in ancient times, um, they were very rare and precious products and were used for all sorts of things, such as medicines, perfume, incense, and of course, the all important flavoring. So between uh, 3000 BC to 2000, uh, excuse me, 200 BC, um, there is evidence of different civilizations that traded and um, controlled some of the world's um, herb and spice trade. And then um, at some point, different civilizations were using them as medicines. And the Romans were uh, first to bring that out in terms of using these plant-based products. And then the Europeans sought to really improve their economy by acquiring a lot of the spices in addition to gold and and they developed some great trading routes so that they can move these things you know across the world globally. But of course, with anything um, in the 15th and 17th century, because there was a lot of competition out there amongst different uh, countries in Europe, wars broke out, particularly between Spain, Portugal, England, and Holland. They all fought for control of the trade spice. 
And then about the 17th century, America joined in on the spice trade and um, started to grow spices on their own. And then what's interesting to note here is um, a kind of a fun fact is that Salem, Massachusetts became the center of spice trade in North America back then. Now this map here just gives you a global perspective of where our spices come from. And you can see if you look over to North America, we really don't produce as many spices as you as you can see in, that come from Europe and, uh, and Asia and even Africa. But this just kind of gives you an overview of all the spices that are out there and you know where they um, are based in terms of um, providing uh, globally to different areas of the world. Now, thanks to early spice trade, as I mentioned on that one slide, there's we have so much access to so many different spices that we can create di dishes that uh, represent really locations from thousands of miles away. So this list shows different cuisines and the spices used to flavor foods. This is one of the hand handouts I will be providing to Shannon that she can pass along to you at the end of this presentation, because it really gives a nice overview of the origin of where some of these spices come by uh, in terms of cuisine. And this handout uh, will be provided to you as well. Uh, and you can see, you can kind of further explore some of these new type of international flavors by adding um, different spices and herbs together and make those, those blends, which are great for grains and proteins in our vegetable dishes and even fruits. So, um, you know, you can kind of see, um, I'll just pick one, for example, in terms of um, the herbs, uh, herb de, uh, herb de Provence, um, you know, where, where um, uh, the different types of foods that you can use them for to really beef up the flavoring. And this becomes very important when we get to the health benefits, because many of these herbs and spices can take the place of salt, which many of us have to, you know, limit. Okay, so let's get into a little bit about cooking with herbs and spices. So herbs and spices are both from plants and they're used in very small amounts to add you know, flavors to food. Um, the herbs generally come from the leaves uh, of the low growing shrubs and spices can come from a, uh, a variety of different parts of the plant. For example, they can come from the root, the bark, the bud, the fruit, the berries, flowers, and seeds. It's just, it could be, a, and it could be a combination of those uh, plant parts. And then when we talk about flavorings, um, they're generally ex, uh, extracts of herbs and spices, or even some non-botanical products. So if you think of things like vanilla extract, or even almond extract, would come, which comes from nuts. So just kind of looking at these um, here, you could see that sometimes you can blend some of these together. You can blend an herb and a spice together and make your own um, special seasonings. So just looking at this, I don't know if you, um, Shannon, I can't see the chat, but um, if any of our participants would like to kind of guess, you know, what these herbs and spices are. So does anyone know what the first one is? Let me see if I could pull down the chat. The one that says leaf. Does anyone know what herb that might be? I'm sure we've all had it. No guesses? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you that one. So the first one is cilantro. So that's used on a lot of um, um, Mexican dishes and, and salads and, and fruits and so forth. The second one, anyone want to take a guess on what that one is? That comes from either the fruit, the berry, or the flower. And I'm sure many of, yes. Okay, thank you, Haley. That's pepper. I was going to say many of us use this probably every single day. How about uh, the bark? Anyone want to guess where that one comes from? Cinnamon. Perfect, Diane. Yeah, so that we can use, sometimes you can buy it as cinnamon sticks, as it's shown there, or you can buy it as, as powder or ground up. And how about the seed? Anyone want to take a stab at what that seed might be? Maybe something that we don't uh, necessarily use. Okay, I see um, it's coriander. Yep, that's correct. 
And then the last one, oh, <laughs> so Haley's putting her answers in already. And the last one is Ginger, correct. So a good job on, on guessing these. Okay. All right. So um, in terms of using culinary herbs, we know that they add flavor. They add, uh, can add a little freshness or punch to your foods. Of course, they add aroma, and in some cases, they can add color. So herbs and spices um, can also encourage healthier eating practices by, as I mentioned earlier, adding really natural bursts of flavor as opposed to using salt or even sugar or sometimes fat to flavor our foods, which, which we still can do. But taking advantage of some of these uh, plant-based seasonings um, is um, definitely a healthy option. Herbs also contain small amounts of phytonutrients or phytochemicals and antioxidants. And that can actually, those can actually prevent cancer, for example, allspice is being studied in terms of its role in cancer. And uh, turmeric is being studied and there's evidence about its role in decreasing inflammation. And, and as we know, um, there's been some, some anecdotal, but also some science research about ginger and how it helps with digestion. So those are just some brief, um, you know, health benefits that they have as well. And then um, there's some evidence out there that herbs can actually help preserve the food uh, quality by um, destroying some of the harmful foodborne pathogens that might be on there. So we also know that um, herbs can improve the, the smell and also the taste of our food. Um, and the actual part of the herb that does that is the essential oils. That contributes to the uh, aroma. So if you think of dried spices, for example, anywhere between five to 15% of spices contain, um, by way, contain essential oils. But when we looked at, we look at dried um, and fresh herbs, it's much less, generally about 1% or even less. And the reason it's less in herbs is because herbs generally have a higher water content than dried herbs. And then the dried herbs lose some of that uh, aromatic chemical uh, property during that drying process. So that's why you might notice when you're using fresh herbs, there's a little bit more aroma there because it has more of the essential oils. What's also interesting is that temperature increases some of these, these uh, volatiles or these uh, aromatic chemicals uh, and increases not only the aroma, but also the flavor. So in that case, you know, uh, using heat or putting them in during the cooking process can actually um, increase the aroma and the taste factor um, of certain herbs and spices. So one good example of that is, is rosemary, for example. And also um, the drying process concentrates the flavor and the extent of the shelf life. So that means that most dried herbs and spices are more soluble in oil than water. So oil, oil can actually bring out more of the aroma than some of the um, water. So you may have seen people, or you may have seen recipes where people are making their own um, herb-based or own spice-based oils because that oil um, can actually bring out some more of the flavor. And you think about it too, you know, if you have a stuffy nose, um, you know, it's harder to smell some of those. Um, those great flavors that you get from herbs and spices. And that's why um, chefs might even toast them, you know, bringing that heat into the equation there because it brings out more of the flavor in both herbs and spices. Okay, so here's a few cooking tips for you to consider. Um, first of all, um, when you're using fresh herbs, um, they have a more subtle taste and you wanna add them to dishes with a shorter cooking Time and the reason is because when you put them in too early, especially some of them, they kind of get uh, they kind of get weepy and they may actually uh, some of the flavor may cook off. So adding like for example delicate herbs, which we would consider like your basil, your chive, your parsley, you want to add them pretty much one to two minutes before you're actually serving them. Now some of the less delicate herbs like rosemary or dill. They're hardier, so you can add them more into the cooking process, maybe 20 minutes um, into the last, you know, the last 20 minutes of the cooking process, and they'll hold their flavor and they'll hold their, their shape and form too. 
So, um, you know, consider the timing when you're adding your herbs and spices that will impact the flavor. And of course, the eye appeal of what they look like. And the dried herbs are really best for the long cooking terms because they re they release their flavors slower. So if you're using the fresh herbs, just remember, add them more toward the end of the cooking process. If you're using dried herbs, you can actually use them in the, in the beginning of the cooking process. Okay, so actually um, what you do with your herbs in terms of grinding or crushing or chopping them, it actually warms the herbs and spices, and then that's more likely that they'll release those good um, um, smells and aromas into your food. So whether you are picking fresh herbs, um, rather than just, you know, put like say a basil leaf into your, your dish, you may want to cut it up, grind it, chop it or something, and it releases more of those flavors. Um, also in terms of retaining flavors throughout the meal, Think about other liquids that can be used to extract some of those flavors. Sometimes alcohol can do that, vinegars as well, and even things like a, like a simple sugar syrup. Um, that can also bring out some of the flavors in your herbs and spices. And here's a very helpful tip too. A sharp knife can actually um, do a better job in terms of releasing those flavors. Because what happens when you use a dull knife, it can actually cause premature discoloring of the herb and it actually acts more as a method of crushing as opposed to in terms of slicing. So using a sharp knife will help maintain that fresher flavor. And sometimes, you know, you just have to periodically, you know, test, do the thumb test or finger test to see how sharp your knife is. And if you feel that it's dull, then certainly I'll bring out your, um, your honing tools or whatever you use to sharpen your knives. And then finally, also too, in terms of you know chopping multiple leaves at one time and keeping them tight and close together um, is a good way of um, helping the release those flavors. And then if you're using anything that's like on a stem, like thyme or rosemary, you want to hold the spring sprig like kind of upside down and run your fingers against the grain to release those um, leaves or pines on you know the needles on there. And then you can decide. Um, whether you want to pull them, put them in your food um, whole, but generally speaking, chopping again is going to either um, even release more of that um, aroma. And then this is just a conversion to consider. As you all know, sometimes we have recipes that call for fresh herbs and we don't have them, and we're not sure about how to substitute them or vice versa. So this this um, slide just shows you the difference in terms of conversing uh, converting them. So, for example, um, if you're creating your own recipes too, then you can begin by, um, you know, looking at how, what you have and what you want to use. So, um, using this guide, if the recipe calls for a tablespoon of fresh chopped um, herb or spice, in this case, we'll, we'll focus on herbs, then if you have dry, you decrease it to a teaspoon. And if you're using the ground, you want to decrease it to a quarter to a half a teaspoon. Now, if you really want to, if you really like the flavor, by all means, you can add more, but start with that a conversion and then add on um, um, to taste after that. Okay, so I want to get into the storing herbs and spices because uh, preparing for this presentation, uh, us educators kind of learned quite a bit about storing. And um, if you think about it, when was the last time you actually looked at the herbs and spices in your pantry or if you keep them in your refrigerator and check the dates and check the freshness and quality? So the next, hopefully these next few slides will give you some tips on, on what you can do um, to check and also to make sure that they're still um, providing those aromas and flavors that you're using them for. So uh, there are some uh, things that impact um, or uh, the the uh, freshness, the uh, flavor, and even the color of the herbs and spices that we that we store in our pantries or cabinets or wherever the case may be. So first, I want to focus a little bit on air. So oxygen can actually cause the natural essential oils 
in the spices to oxidize. And what that does, it cuts down on the flavor and the potency. So you wanna make sure that you're storing your herbs and spices in very tightly covered containers. And every time that you open the bottle and take some out and put in, you know, close the bottle, make sure that you close the lid tightly immediately after your use. Because even exposing it for a, a couple of extra minutes will impact how long that spice is going to last. The other thing to consider is light. So, for example, light exposure can cause the ingredients, especially in pigmented uh, spices, like if you think of things like um, red chili powder or some of the green herbs like basil and, and parsley, if, the, if these herbs and spices are exposed to light over time, they can really deteriorate, not only in color, but in the flavor as well. So the message here is that you really want to store your um, herbs and spices in a uh, dark place away from sunlight. Now, some of us probably keep things on our counter that we use on a regular basis. You may want to consider that um, or reconsider that in terms of if there's another place that you can keep them handy uh, that's darker and away from not only air, not only light, but getting into heat, which is our next component that we have to be concerned about in terms of maintaining our you know, flavor, color, and um, potency of our herbs and spices. So what heat can actually do is it can decrease the quality of herbs and spices too. So you wanna avoid storing any of your herbs and spices, not only near a stove, but also near a microwave or a heating vent in your kitchen, um, especially those if you're storing your spices in like, like an open wrap uh, situation. And also do not add herbs and spices when you're cooking directly from the original container over the stovetop. Because even those few seconds where you're opening up the lid and you're pouring them in and you're getting the heat coming up from whatever you're cooking, that can impact your spice as well. So what you might wanna do is open the jar off to the side, take out what you need maybe in a small spoon or, or a, a cup or a bowl, close the lid and then add that into the, um, the pan or pot or whatever you're cooking. And then finally, moisture can uh, also um, impact the, um, our, our, our herbs and spices. So what happens with that is moisture can actually produce, uh, or the humidity from moisture can produce mold. And then that could lead to not only flavor loss, but also not, you know, spices and herbs that are really not safe to eat. So to avoid that, you wanna make sure that you don't store your herbs close to water sources. So that would include things like a sink, a dishwasher, and even a refrigerator. Because if you think about it, refrigerators um, can form a condensation um, if they're very close to the counter where you're storing them. And um, especially in, in humid times or you know, humid seasons. So that can also impact your spices. So these are four things that you need to consider as to where you're storing your spices. So really overall best practice is find a drawer or a cabinet or a cupboard or your pantry that's dark and away from the heat sources, the moisture and the light, and then make sure that whatever um, uh, container that you're using, that the lid is very tight as well. Okay, so speaking of storage containers, um, what's recommended is um, to buy, first of all, to buy container uh, spices that are in plastic containers. You can use tins, you could use glass, but preferably if there's a colored glass, like an amber glass or um, something that are green or a dark blue, because again, if, if you're storing it in a clear glass and you're not in a very dark area, then you're going to have light um, um, exposed to your herbs and spices. And you can also use um, sealed mason jars as well. Now, if you're buying your spices in bulk, which many of us do, and that, that's a fine process, um, you know, a way to pack, um, buy them and package them um, into smaller containers, but just make sure that when you pour them out of the original containers, that you're choosing any of these types of options that are listed on this slide um, so that they do maintain that good quality, the flavor and color. So any of these would work as well. Um, 
And it's interesting too, because um, if you think about how we buy spices, in the supermarket, it, you know, we do see them in tins, but we also see them in glass jars and many times they're not in color jars. So if you're buying them that way, then you want to make sure that you're definitely storing them in a dark part in your kitchen or ever you, wherever you store them. Okay, so this was a really interesting find for us as educators in terms of how long um, those herbs and spices can last. And I'm, in the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll provide you with some ways that you can test. But just like any foods you have in your pantry, you need to check the dates on the spices and herbs. They don't necessarily spoil um, as quickly and make you sick, like from a food product per se, but they can lose their flavor as we saw, you know, in these past slides, what can happen to them. So to ensure your spices and herbs, um, to make sure that they're having that flavor that you're buying and using them for, you should take a few minutes to check the freshness. You could do it a couple times a year. Some people like to do it seasonally. Season, seasonally. Um, whatever works best for you, but check those best by dates on the bottle or the tin or whatever the packaging is. And then um, if, they, if they are past that date, significantly past that date, you know, a couple months wouldn't make a difference, especially if you're storing them properly. But I, after doing this presentation, I went through <laughs> some of my spices and realized, okay, there's a few here that need to um, be discarded. And, um, and then I did some of the freshness tests, which I'll show you in a second. And sure enough, they weren't really providing the seasoning and flavoring that I was hoping for. Um, so keep that in mind and, you know, just toss out any stale spices. But here's a really fun fact doing some of this, the research on this is that I think we're all familiar with McCormick Spices, which is a big spice company, um, not too, you know, locally, not too far from us uh, here in Maryland. Um, but except for the black pepper, um, and this was a fun fact on their website we found, McCormick Spices in those rectangular tins that they generally sell them in, um, they can last up to 25 years if you store them properly. So, you know, Again, you'll, the way you'll know that you stored them properly, or if they're still good to use, is some of these um, tests that we're going to do, and I'll show you in a second. So that's basically storage for your dried herbs and spices. But as we know, many of us probably have great herb and um, spice gardens, or mostly herb probably gardens, and we want to be able to use those um, throughout the growing season, season, and hopefully even beyond. So here's a couple of methods that you can um, use to store your fresh herbs. So for example, um, it's interesting, I will say that many um, companies don't recommend storing spices in the refrigerator or freezer because over time, those changes, you know, even going in and out of the refrigerator or in and out of the freezer can cause that condensation and the mold and it can develop and so forth. But for fresh herbs, we certainly can um, store them not only in, in our rooms or kitchens, but we can also store them in the refrigerator and the freezer. So there's three different methods here. So basically in the, the room method, which could be in your kitchen, I actually like to put some of my herbs and spices, not for use, but I use them as air fresheners in my bathroom. So when people walk in and they smell mint or rosemary, it's just, it's just a really nice scent. But in any event, you wanna trim the base of the stem with a sharp knife or scissor, and then you can store it in a jar with some water, usually filled about halfway, as you could see in, in these images. Um, but if you're going to use these for seasoning, for cooking purposes, then you wanna cover the jar with some plastic wrap and secure it with a, um, a rubber band. And that'll last a couple of days for, for it that way. If you wanna use the refrigerated method, then you can see here, you, you would actually use a towel so um, you wanna wrap the herbs in like a damp paper towel, as you can see here, and then you wanna place them in a zipper type storage bag in your refrigerator. And I've gotten a good week out of some of the more hardier herbs like um, my um, rosemary. Some of the other herbs too, um, you can get several days out of the, doing it this method as well. And then finally, you can freeze them. But what you want to do first when you freeze them is you want to wash them, drain them, pat them dry as, as much as you can, uh, as much as possible. And then you want to actually strip the leaves off the stem and spread them out like on a cookie sheet or a tray or something 
and then you want to place them in the freezer for about 30 minutes. And then after that, you take them out and you can put them in like freezer bags or any other freezer type storage containers that you use. And then when you do need them, you could just kind of pull out what you need for that particular recipe and then you know, leave the rest in the freezer for future use. Uh, you want to be careful that you don't let them thaw because once they thaw, they get very weepy and then, you know, the best there, probably you can throw them in a sauce or something or a soup, but they're not going to have that um, nice, pretty, fresh green look to them uh, once they thaw out. Okay, so I want to get into some of the tests for freshness that I just mentioned, because this is going to be very important for you as you go through your your spice drawers or your pantry or your cupboard to test to see if they're still um, doing what um, they should be in terms of having that, you know, flavorful, um, aromatic um, um, impact on your foods. So the, um, the first test is the aroma test, and that's pretty much what it, it uh, is. You want to take some of your spices, you want to rub them in your hand. And then you open up your hands. Now, if the aroma is weak, it means it's time to toss them, that they're really not going to be providing a lot of flavor to your foods. Um, another te uh, test you could do is the taste test. And it's okay to taste the spices. However, if you're finding that there's they're lacking the flavor that, you know, that you're looking for, then they're probably past their prime as well, too, and you want to toss them out. Now, they're not unsafe to use, but they're just not going to give you the flavor that you hope for in the food or the recipe that you're preparing. And then finally, there's the color test. And what you wanna look for is those vibrant colors. So for example, if you're using um, basil, you wanna make sure it's green and not like a dull gray. Or if you're looking for, if you're using cinnamon, you wanna make sure it's that nice, you know, brownish orange color, or turmeric is that nice, yellow color or, or curry is. So if they start losing their color, then chances are they're also the, you know, the flavor's fading too. So um, if any of those things occur, again, you can use them, but they're not gonna give you that flavor that you're looking for. And um, I will be also giving you some information about going to McCormick's website and you can review these processes because they explain them really well um, on their website. Okay, so I want to get into some food safety aspects here of using herbs and spices. So I have to give a shout out to these images. So my co-worker, Shauna Henley, who um, is our food safety guru and also our food preservation um, expert, um, actually made some oils here that you can see these are from her counter and um, really is um, provided all of us on the team aspects of how important it is that um, not only that we're using foods that are safe to consume, but also about herbs and spices. So what we're gonna provide it here in this presentation, a couple of next slides, is more about what the industry does in terms of making sure that our herbs and spices are safe. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a kind of process here in terms of um, the procedures that are, are taken to make sure that from the natural state to the point where we're cooking them, um, that there are steps in place to make sure our, uh, the food supply of our herbs and spices is, is safe. Okay, so from we start from the grower to harvesting them, to drying and sanitizing them, whether it's done commercially or even if we're doing that in our home, um, University of Maryland Extension does offer drying herb and food classes. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. And then measuring them out and making sure that uh, they're, they're, they're um, sorted and clean and then you know, exported out to us. So through this diagram, you could see that there is a process in place. Um, also too, from that, the next step, you know, it goes from not only the washing, the chopping, the, the pasteurizing and blanching and so forth, but there's also processes in terms of, you know, they're roasted, they could be ground and then blended, vacuum sealed, transported to make sure throughout all these steps that the ingredients are safe by the time they get to us on the grocery store shelves. So, you know, processing sometimes gets a bad rap. We think of processed foods, 
But in this case, processing is very important because we want to make sure that from grower to our plate that the, the herbs and spices and foods in general um, are safe for us to eat. So in terms of maintaining or improving that nutrient content, we wanna make sure that our draw, uh, dried and frozen herbs and spices, you know, that contain those trace elements and contribute to our health to healthy diet uh, are maintained. Um, also the processing, um, um, the processing itself can extend shelf life and can reduce food waste. So think about it, if we're using fresh herbs and spices from our garden versus purchasing ones that are have been processed and dried, we can actually use those for a much longer period of time than we uh, uh, can if we're using fresh herbs and spices. And as we mentioned too, that um, the um, processing can also enhance um, through drying uh, that concentrated flavor that we can use with the dried herbs and spices. Reflecting back to my slide, you know, the herbs, when we're um, putting them in a recipe, we're using a higher volume than we're, we're using dried than versus what we're using in terms of the ground. So, you know, during this whole process, the FDA is involved um, through the Food Safety and Moderniz Modernization Act, as, as with all foods that we consume. So they make sure that uh, both domestic and imported spices, uh, which is mostly our, um, our food supply, um, are safe. So basically in the US, it's interesting to note that with the exception of things like dehydrated um, um, onions and garlic and mustard seed, most of the spices that we consume are imported. So that's why it's very important that we do have processes in place to make sure that they're safe from um, um, mold, bacteria, and you know other foodborne illnesses that herbs can be exposed to. Not at the same level as fresh foods and beverages that we consume, but they certainly can be. And then a little bit about um, some research that they have found with certain bacteria. So um, salmonella has been linked with some spice contamination and human illness. Um, so therefore that drying herb and spice process can uh, combat that. And then Clostridium botulinum, which is very rare. Generally, you think of that in canning, but there have been some um, outbreaks um, from people making their own home infused oils. So again, um, you want to make sure that if you are doing that, that you're you're using lab tested uh, recipes, and you, and um, Extension has a resource for that. So if anyone is interested in recipes for making your own infused oils, please contact me after the presentation. I'll be happy to share those with you. But there still is a lot of research out there in terms of um, you know looking at. Um, herbs and spices, and then, you know, what other natural properties they have that can actually help slow growth and kill bacteria. Lots of research is out there. Um, there we're looking at things such as uh, irradiation, which is, you know, um, applying heat and breaking down the pathogens. It's different than radiation. Um, they're using different types of gases that um, can also keep our food safe. So there's lots of different processes out there that they test to make sure that they're safe for us and that they do the trick with um, decreasing any type of foodborne illnesses um, related to herbs and spices. And then finally, um, just a little bit about antimicrobials, which basically there is some um, emerging research actually that shows that some herbs and spices can actually have these antimicrobial, antifungal effects. And they're looking at herbs and spices such as clove, oregano, thyme, cinnamon, cumin. There seems to be some properties within these spices um, that can uh, combat um, different types of bacteria and other pathogens. So that's interesting um, and um, for us too, as educators and consumers to know that there's an extra added bonus to using these herbs and spices. Okay, so just again, uh, keeping your herbs and spices, just as a reminder here,
make sure you're cooking um, your foods and to make sure that um, you're reducing any contamination overall from that perspective. And that you also practice safe food handling in your kitchen, washing your hands constantly, um, whether you're touching, you know, raw meat to, to uh, raw vegetables, et cetera. So just kind of keep these things in mind um, that you want to practice, use those same practices, whether you're using foods or herbs and spices. Okay, so a couple slides here about health claims. Uh, I'm not going to get into uh, this too much, but just kind of um, know that there's many health claims out there <clears throat> that are stating medicinal uses of herbs and spices. Uh, however, there's not a lot of research out there quite yet. So there is some promise, um, promising research, but nothing that has been um, tested rigorously enough to say that herbs and spices can make um, claims. However, I will note that cinnamon and diabetes and a turmeric and inflammation, there's a lot of uh, evidence for those having those health benefits, but not enough for them to make claims actually on their labels that you might see some foods um, might have health claims, for example, oat bran and cholesterol. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and also, even though some of these studies suggest the benefits, we still do need a little bit more research before that um, stamp of approval can get on these um, herbs and spices. And um, this is just, it looks like a little bit of a complicated slide here, but this is just kind of the relationship um, that herbs and spices have to a healthy diet. So we do know by eating a balanced diet, for example, we're going to get a lot of those phytochemicals or those plant-based nutrients that protect our cells and our free radicals. We don't want a lot of those free radicals hanging out inside of us because they can actually attack our cells and cause what we call oxidative stress. Uh, which is not good for our cells, and then that can lead to cell damage and inflammation, and then more inflammation can lead to chronic diseases. So it's kind of a complicated path here, but the end, you know, the end message here is that using herbs and spices can have some health benefits as as well as, um, you know, the seasoning and um, flavoring and uh, aromatic properties that we use them for. Okay, so I want to bring your attention here to some research and resources for culinary herbs. So, um, this is a great, uh, these are 2 great websites here. We have the N NIH, which is the National Center for complementary and integrative health. So, what I like about this uh, website is if you have a herb that you're interested in, for example, let's say you want to, you're interested to learn more about the research behind cinnamon. You can actually go to this website and I'll provide you the link to this and um, type in cinnamon and it'll bring back, bring out um, all the research that's done, has been done on cinnamon. And if any of the health benefits um, are, you know, close enough to make a recommendation or um, if there is some evidence that they, you know, they are effective. So that's a great resource if you want to kind of pull out individual um, herbs and spices. And then the McCormick Institute, and even though McCormick is in the name, they did provide the original funding for this institute, but it's now an independent uh, body. So there's no conflict of interest in that aspect. The, uh, the McCormick interest also provides lots of articles about um, herbs and spices, and you can scroll down and read them. Um, they provide summaries and so forth. So if you're just interested in learning a little bit more about the research that's being done on these, these are two great websites, and again, I'll provide uh, Shannon with the um, links so that you can uh, visit them at your leisure and, you know, um, do some fun research on your own. All right, and then just wrapping up uh, the last couple slides, I want to go through some of the um, the the um, health benefits I mentioned earlier about salt replacement. So we know too much sodium in our diet is not good for chronic diseases such as high blood pressure and heart disease. So using some of these herbs and spices can really ha help cut back on the use of salt and then keeping in mind that, you know, using, as I mentioned earlier, using those ground and dried herbs provide a very intense flavor. So use about a third of what you'd normally use if you were using your fresh herbs and spices in place of salt. 
So think of also too that in place of using like a garlic salt or an onion salt, if you want to use the dried onions or the garlic powder or uh, garlic um, garlic powder or onion powders in place of the salt. So that's a good way to cut back as well. Uh, in terms of sugar replacement, for those of you that might um, uh, be um, managing diabetes or prediabetes, or if you just want to cut out your added sugar intake, cinnamon, um, cardamom, star anise, these are all kind of what they call like sweeter spices. So they can actually take the place of sugar in terms of the taste. Now, if you're baking, I would not recommend substituting out, you know, a cup of sugar for a cup of cinnamon, but just bear in mind that in some recipes, if you can reduce the amount of, a cin um, excuse me, sugar, and replace it with one of these other spices, then you are making your healthy, your recipes healthier as well. And at still keeping that nice sweet um, taste that you're looking for. Um, a little bit about herbal supplements where um, I don't wanna get too much into this presentation because actually there's presentations out there that just discuss um, specifically about that. Uh, basically uh, herbal supplements are usually something that are maybe taken orally uh, they contain multiple herbs uh, for centuries, as I mentioned earlier, they have been used for healing properties and, and um, uh, different um, health issues. They are regulated by the FDA, but the caveat here is you have to be very mindful if you're on taking any type of medications because there are um, evidence, uh, strong evidence about um, drug and or medication interaction with herbs that the herbs can actually impact the efficacy of the medications or can actually cause some negative um, um, side effects from that. So bottom line here is if you're interested in herbal supplements, check with your healthcare provider and hopefully they can help um, point you in the right direction if, if any of these, if any herbal supplements are um, permissible for you to take based on that. And I mentioned essential oils earlier, the same thing here, use those tested recipes and also talk with your healthcare provider too as well when it comes to that. And then finally, some resources that we have here at Extension, if you haven't already uh, visited them, our website has just been updated. So if you're having any difficulty, um, again, reach out to me and I'll point you in the right direction but we have a home and garden information center, which provides lots of information about herbs, growing herbs, storing herbs. Um, I'm trying to think what else is in there. Different types of, you know, container gardens versus in-ground versus raised beds. And then also um, each of our county websites, if you're in uh, Maryland, we have um, links to not only this home and garden center, but we have some uh, local links that might be helpful to you as well through our master gardener program, for example. And then finally, um, we have our eat smart, um, resources through the college of ag. So you can type in a recipe or an ingredient and, um, we can actually, it can actually pull up some, um, recipes for you that you might want to use. For example, if you have, you know, certain amount of herbs or you're growing lots of tomatoes or something like that, then you can, we have some recipes that you can pull up too. And then finally, um, through our um, extension program, we have not only, as I mentioned, the Grow and Eat a program through our Master Gardener uh, program, but through our Family Consumer Science uh, uh, program, we've taken it a step further and we've added not only grow it, eat it, but preserve it. So we have food preservation programs for all different types of foods. We use, uh, we teach water bath, pressure uh, canning, we teach how to freeze foods properly, and, and that's very important. And then we also have drying food programs, if you're interested in that. And our food for uh, profit program is anyone who has an entrepreneurial spirit and wants to start a food business. Okay, so um, I'm at the Q&A section here. I don't know if, um, Shannon, there's any questions in the chat? We do have some questions. Um, the first one that's in the chat is about the substitutes for salt. Could you talk about those replacements again? Sure. You mean actual uh, spices and herbs that replace salt? Yes. It's, okay. Yeah. So really, it's it's a taste factor. So um, 
you can just, you know, off the top when you think of, you know, what goes well. So if you want to cut back on salt, well, do you like onion? You know, can you use, you can certainly uh, substitute onion powder, um, garlic powder. Um, there's also uh, seasonings out there on the market that are salt free. And I'll throw a couple brands out there. Not that I'm endorsing any of them, but I'm sure you've all heard of like Mrs. Dash. Um, a lot of those seasonings are blends of different herbs and spices without salt. I know some of the other sport, um, the other um, spice companies also are making their own salt free blends as well. So I would just peruse, take some time in the, the spice aisle in your local grocery store and see what's out there. And, you know, I personally, I've never been a big salt user, but I, when, when I want to punch a flavor for me, my go-to herbs, because I grow them and I, and I have an enormous amount because they multiply. If anyone has grown rosemary, they know that for sure. But I use rosemary in lots of dishes, even things that I haven't thought of. And I know this may, might sound bizarre, but um, I make a lot of my own flavored waters, but rosemary and lemon, I've put rosemary on um, all kinds of meats all kinds of vegetables. So I would just say, just experiment and, and, and try, you know, different uh, combinations. Um, you know, even things like um, different peppers that you might wanna try, um, oregano, thyme, there's just so many opportunities. Okay, um, did you say there was maybe more questions? There are, yep, yep. Um, and some people have already saved those links. So that's that's great to hear. Um, the question was about McCormick. Um, we were talking about it and it, it's a Maryland company. Yes. Does that mean we can grow just about any herb or spice we want, except maybe the peppercorns that you mentioned? So I guess it's uh, asking more like what we can grow here in Maryland. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a really good question. I don't think there's any limitations other than from a weather perspective and you know, certainly maybe people that are living on the shore um, in terms of their soil, their weather conditions is going to be different than people living out in the western counties. But, um, Shannon, I'll ask you, that might be more a question for um, any of the women in ag here. Um, to my knowledge, you can grow any herbs you like because you can actually grow your herbs indoors. Um, I, start, I started with a small rosemary plant three years ago and then put it in the ground, uh, probably around Memorial Day. And if you saw it now, it looks, it's it's overtaken half of my uh, landscape because I thought I would just put it in there to make it look nice, but um, it's, it's overwhelming. And the other thing I discovered this year too, is I grew thyme last year, which is generally an annual herb, but it came back. So I don't know if it's because it was a mild winter or what, but I noticed that some of my herbs are starting to sprout that normally would not, you know, they're, they're not perennials. So, yeah, overrun. Yep. yeah, so I think it, I think it was conditions, but I don't think we're limited to any, as long as we have, you know, the seeds to do so. I don't know about yeah. pepper though. That's a good one. I'm not sure if we can grow pepper. I can find that out. I'm going to write that question down. I'll get back to you on that one because I'm not sure about that one. Yep. Thank you, Haley. Yeah, pepper is a is a tropical plant. Yeah, Haley, okay. any information you have in there about growing herbs? I mean, we can grow a lot of herbs here. I think the larger companies probably source them from larger growers than what we do. Um, most of the growers that have herbs um, in this area, it's more for market garden cut type things, mm -hmm. not for actual processing, you know, bulk large amounts. Um, so there's another question here. Let's see. Um, looking for information on the lab tested infused oil recipes. So I can get you um, the individual's email because um, they yes. are looking for some of that. Yep. And then um, about like how to get in touch with canning classes. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Um, so as you know, we've had a pandemic and uh, actually I'm going to go on. Um, let me go back. Let me open, start my video again. Since we're done here. Um, well, actually, I just want to see if I have any other. Stuff. Well, um, let me just go off here so that you can see me. Just give me a moment here. Okay. And you want to stop sharing? Start. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, this is fine. So, um, uh, what we're doing currently is, um, because we we're just beginning to go back in person, um, and that's going to vary by, um, uh, counties. I know I'm in Cecil County, so we are going back in person a couple days a week. So we can offer in person classes. And I know for a fact, like in, I, in my building, I use my kitchen down the hall in our, our, in our uh, senior center. So I have access to that. But a lot of educators don't have access to the kitchens that we ne normally use. So right now we're just doing like a lot of virtual uh, canning 101 programs. Uh, we're hoping um, within the next couple of months to be able to do some in person programs. Like I know my uh, colleague out in the Western County, uh, Lisa McCoy, she is actually scheduling some in person programming. So, what I would suggest you do, um, we are going to be um, posting all our programming on our website. So, you'll have to go to the, what I'll do is I'll provide you all, let me just jot this down, the UME website to uh, see where our classes are. And um, we will be doing some virtual, so it's gonna be a lot different because normally our in-person programs, they're hands-on. So we have a lecture part and then we bring you all into the kitchen. The programs are small for obvious reasons. And then you're actually you know, hands-on doing the, um, the canning and preserving. So we have, to, we have some um, restrictions right now with that. But what I will do is I will provide you with our website where to find the classes. You may not see many posted at this moment. Just check back periodically over the next couple of weeks and see, you know, what's offered out there. If it's a virtual uh, class, I think, you know, all our classes virtually are going to be free. Once we go back in person, we do have a small cost just to cover for um, the uh, ingredients and so forth that we need to do the canning. And of course you take home a sample of what you made. So um, just, um, just check periodically at this point is the answer I have to give you right now, unfortunately. So there's, um, I, I did pop into the links, uh, some of the like grow it, preserve it um, into the chat pod for everyone. Mm -hmm. One is our food safety and the other is our home gardening website. So there's some resources there. Um, Sounds like you don't go with rosemary. Somebody asked if you uh, do you share the rosemary cuttings. <laughs> um, actually, what I'm so it's funny you mentioned that because I love one of my favorite classes to do is the drawing herbs because we have some fun activities for the participants. So whenever I do that in person program, you are getting uh, my my fresh rosemary. I just had be become so creative with it because I didn't want to waste it, and it all winter long. It just seemed like every morning I woke up, it just, it just wouldn't stop. I have so right, much of right. it, but you, it'll, it'll happen to you too. So even if you start with a plant from your local garden center, or if you want to start from seeds, you put that in the ground Memorial Day or just before Memorial Day, I guess I did. Um, and it just, it just morphs. It's just unbelievable. And then I try to share with my neighbors and their plants are even bigger than mine. So, um, I don't know what to say <laughs> um, other than I'm happy. I'm happy to have it because there's just so many things that you can do with Rosemary. Um, well, and we, so interestingly, someone in the chat pod has said that um, their daughter is allergic to Rosemary. How common are allergies oh to herbs? And um, she's been hesitant to use other herbs, uh, afraid to expose sort of more allergies. So. I don't know. Um, I, I'd be interested in the age of your daughter if there's um, if you could put that in the chat pod because uh, I've not heard of that. I have not either. I'm just making myself a note when I hang when we end this program today. I'm going to check on um, to see how prevalent herb allergies are. I haven't heard that yeah. either. I mean, I I don't think it's um, unheard of, but. Um, yeah, and you know, in some cases, you know, people were finding that, and maybe Shani, you can address this too. It's not necessarily the plant; it could be something that perhaps growers are using, or it could be something in the soil. I mean, I, I I don't know, but I'll check into that. I'll find out, and and if there's any information about um, whether someone has an allergy to one herb, does it predispose them to having allergies to others? 
and I understand your concern. I, I absolutely do. But um, other than getting an allergy test, I don't know how you find that out unless you, you know, consumed it and that. Yeah, she said that um, she's 21 and, and found out she was allergic when she was about seven. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, people do grow out of allergies, um, but you have to talk with your or your daughter has to talk with her healthcare provider how to approach that, you know, whether they want feel that it's possible to reintroduce or not. Because in some cases, you're going to have that allergy for life. In some cases, you do grow out of them. And in some cases, you develop allergies later in life and didn't have them as, as youth. So there's all different scenarios for that. Okay, are there any Perfect. other questions? Um, no, but people and very much enjoyed it, Beverly. I, I enjoyed it myself. So thank you very much for taking the time today to um, share this great information with us. I think we focus a lot on the production side and I love to be able to focus on this side about, you know, the food side of it um, right. and the food and preservation side. Yeah, and and that we, we you know we we can grow them, and it's so easy to grow um, herbs, and and they have such beneficial uh, properties aside from just the flavoring. I do want to make one really quick comment about McCormick's that you, I think you covered though. McCormick's is located here, but um, McCormick's is more of the processing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much they grow because, as I mentioned no. here, um, from a consumer. Uh, in dust industry perspective, most of our herbs come um, from other um, continents and countries. Uh, we don't uh, produce them in mass quantities like um, other places do. We import most of our herbs and spices, uh, uh, spices, I should say, not herbs, spices. So anyway, okay, so I will, um, I will get out those resources to you all. I'll provide you with the, the link to our website again. Just be patient. Um, the website just went up um, last week, Shannon. I think it was. Yeah. So we're working out some kinks. We're trying to figure out, you know, where we're going to be posting our programming. And then, um, if anyone has it has any difficulty finding any information, I will also provide you with my email address. You can reach out to me specifically. And then I definitely want to do some re research on herb allergies because that's the first time I've gotten that question with this uh, presentation, and I'm sure. That's good information to share moving forward. So wonderful. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording at this point.